Bobby Fischer and Mikhail Tall were warriors on the chessboard. Their games were fierce fighting games. Of course, they had symbolism around the globe, Fischer representing the West and uh, Tall representing the Soviet Union. But on the board, their games were full of drama, even though, as it turns out, they were friends off of it. And this game is no different. Every move in this game is filled with drama, and the variations get pretty hairy, as we will see as we go ahead. Uh, Fisher had the white pieces in this game from the Olympiad. Mikhail Tall had black. Fisher began with the move E4, as he always did. Best by test, he said. E6. Tall plays the French defense, a, a fighting system. D4, D5. And white can do many things here, obviously. They can play the advanced variation, or knight to D2, the Tarash. Fisher plays the main line, knight to C3, supporting and defending the pawn at E4, and putting the knight on its most aggressive post. Here, Tall plays bishop to b4, or the winnower variation of the French defense. And this opening basically is designed to create as many imbalances as you can possibly create on the board. And Tall does succeed in doing that. Fisher goes ahead and plays e5, the main line here. Tall plays c5, attacking the base of the pawn chain. It's typical French stuff. Bobby Fisher plays a3. Again, this is all main line attacking this bishop on b4, saying make a decision. Now, the main move here by far is uh, bishop takes knight check. Uh, but Tall played the more rare bishop to a5. And this is a very interesting idea. Uh, Fisher plays b4. Now, at first, this looks like a mistake, right? I mean, uh, cb4, ab4, bishop takes pawn. I mean, you've lost a pawn and you still have this pin. But that's not how the play would actually continue after cb4. Uh, Fisher would play knight to b5, threatening to jump into d6 with check. And after pawn takes pawn check, obviously that doesn't unveil this check, white just plays c3. And now after bishop c7, let's say, to control d6, bishop takes a3, and now black is going to have a lot of trouble castling. He's got real problems on the dark squares. White is just clearly, clearly better. So. Instead, Tall played C takes D4 in instead of that move. Queen to G4 from Fisher, aggressive play. I mean, right now the knight hangs, the bishop hangs, and the pawn at G7 is attacked. So we're already in a position that's sort of a crazy, a crazy position. Tall plays knight to E7, continuing on standard winnower paths. Fisher finally takes the bishop, and Tall takes the knight. Queen takes g7, rook g8, queen takes h7. And this is a very standard position and structure for a win of her, uh, French defense. Basically, the imbalances are this. White has the two bishops and an extra pawn. And that extra pawn is passed and can advance up the h-file very quickly. In fact, normally you would just say white has a winning advantage except for one problem. What is white going to do with his king? That's the issue. If Fisher castles kingside, then Tall will attack down the G and H file. If he castles queenside, you can see how many holes there are over here. And usually, in most winnowers, a black keeps his king in the center of the board. We'll see how Fisher handles this problem in this game. Tall plays knight B to C6, attacking Fisher's nice pawn at E5. Fisher does not uh, advance the F pawn, but instead defends it with the knight, developing a piece, and uh, which is a good approach here, I think. Tall plays queen to c7, attacking e5 a second time. Now Fisher plays bishop to b5, pinning the knight that is attacking the pawn on e5. If Tall were to take on g2, that would actually be a mistake because of king f1. When the rook goes back, you just play rook to g1. When the rooks come off, uh, not only is White's king much safer now than it was in the middle of the board. The threats of queen to h8 check are really irritating for black. Like if you were to play bishop d7, queen to h8 check would just win. The knight would have to block and he would, he would lose it. So uh, this is a, not a good position for black, so Tall does not do that. Instead, he just plays bishop to d7, relieving the pin on the c6 knight. Fisher then castles. You don't see that so much in uh, the winnower, but because he defended e5 with a knight instead of playing f4, he feels he can safely castle on the king side. We'll see. And the tall castles long. Very standard. So basically, we have opposite sides castling, two bishops, extra material. I mean, the position is really, really sharp. 
Um, com modern computers say the best move for white is just rook to e1, defending e5, keeping things uh, together. Um, bishop takes knight was a possibility, and after bishop takes c6, queen f7, d4, queen e6, check, king b8. Fisher, in his book My 60 Memorable Games, said after knight to g5, the knight is defended by the bishop at c1, uh, white is just completely winning. He's up three pawns, and after f4, defending the knight, uh, it's, it's over. Modern computers actually see this as equal, believe it or not, even with all that material advantage, because this bishop at c6 is such a monster on the light squares. It sees it as compensation for three pawns. Really uh, astonishing. Fisher's choice in the game was bishop to g5, uh, pinning the knight on e7, and uh, it looks like black is in a bit of a bind. And now Tall makes a very accurate move and a very sharp move. He jumps into the lion's mouth with knight takes e5. Now everything is hanging. He's threatening the knight on f3, the bishop on b5, uh, but also his own knight at e7 is hanging. If the knight at f3 goes, the bishop at g5 goes. Rook g is threatening the g2. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, let's look at some uh, possibilities. If Fisher were to play knight, uh, bishop takes knight at e7, that would be a blunder because then knight f3 check. The knight can't be recaptured because of there's a g pawn is pinned, so king h1 would be forced, and then just rook uh, to h8. And if the queen moved, rook to h2 is checkmate, so that would be a mistake. Um, if bishop takes d7 check, rook takes d7, knight takes e5, queen e5, bishop e7, rook to h8, and it looks like black is just winning. When the queen moves, it'll be mate at h2, but uh, white could counterattack with the, uh, the a1 rook, and after rook takes queen, rook takes queen, rook takes e7, Fisher actually thought black was much better here because he could just, you know, move his king up easily, and then the pawns in the center uh, would just roll. But again, modern computers do see this as equal, but it looks much easier to play for black. So Fisher avoided that possibility. Instead, what Fisher played was knight takes e5. And again, Tall has many choices. The bishop at g5 hangs, bishop and knight all hang. Um, if he takes the knight at e5 with the queen, then bishop takes e7, rook h8. Again, this idea of sort of meeting at h2 for mate, and again, the idea of counterattacking the queen, uh, queen to b8. And Fisher thought this was bad, uh, that, that, that white was lost here, because eventually the queen has to move and the pawn would fall. But actually, after bishop takes d7 check, uh, computers show a ridiculous move that you would never expect any human to see. Really amazing. He can't retake the bishop with the rook because then the rook at h8 would fall. So he would have to take with the king. And then this ridiculous move, bishop to d6. <laughs> Interfering with the queen's access to h2, but allowing white's queen to take on f7 with check. And if, uh, he would have to just take the, the queen and play this equal endgame. If he uh, took the, the bishop, and after queen f7 check, queen, queen f3, uh, white's actually better here. And with the black's king in the middle of the board, and he still has that material. Uh, really, really amazing stuff. So uh, bishop takes b5 was actually played in the game by Tall, attacking the rook on f1. Fisher counterattacks with knight takes f7, hitting the rook on d8. Bishop takes f1, knight takes d8. And here, Fisher is threatening to uh, take the knight and protect the excuse, yeah take the knight and protect his knight at d8. So Tall can't just retreat his bishop. He has to take the uh, bishop at g5, which he does. Rook takes g5, and now knight takes e6, forking the queen and the rook, but allowing this move from Tall. Rook takes g2, check. Now, in, what if White takes the bishop here? That looks like a decent move. What Fisher was worried about in the game was the idea of rook takes h2 with uh, th threats of check and also threatening the queen uh, at h7. Um, queen f7, rook to h1 check, and Fisher thought this was a, a winning attack. Uh, but it turns out white can survive with this move, king to g2. And after queen to h2, king to f3, uh, white is actually surviving in this position according to, uh, to modern engines. Really unbelievable. But uh, king to h1 in was instead played by Fisher to avoid that line. Queen to e5, obviously Fisher's threatening the queen. So now the queen moves and is threatening the knight at uh, e6. 
rook takes f1, queen takes e6, and he's allowing his rook on g2 to hang, but for a very specific purpose. Fisher takes the rook, and then queen to g4 checked by Tall, and after all these incredible mind-bending complications, we, did, we just scratched the surface, of course. It would take two hours of video to really see everything. Uh, the game ends in a perpetual check, as you can see as the king moves here. We just go back and forth, and uh, that would be it. So this uh, master class in complications. Tall did take the game into a deep, dark forest, but Fisher was able to survive. I hope you enjoyed this game. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.